Good morning. Today's reading comes to us from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 10 through 17. Then Esther spoke to Hathok and gave him a message from Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself have not been called in to the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at such times as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said and replied to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Aiden. You know the expression, that's a hill I would die on, right? A hill I would die on is a cause that you believe in, a cause that you would give your life to, a cause that you would invest your resources in, right? And so just for fun, this last week on my social media, as I posed the question, what is the most trivial, least significant, silliest hill that you would die on? And there were a bunch of just simply amazing responses. I think We have uncovered a great uh, controversy among us with the positioning of the toilet paper uh, (laughs) conflict. That is a hill that some people would die on, like over the top or underneath. And I personally have never had that much trouble tearing off toilet paper. I don't know what's the big deal, but it is a hill that some people would die on. Some of my other favorites were um, pineapple does not belong on pizza, which I mean, I kind of agree. I don't know if it's a hill I would die on, but it's a pretty good one. Uh, I also liked, um, I still put two spaces after every period, um, which is a hill some of us old school writers will die on uh, because they don't do that anymore. Um, Dr. Pepper is the superior soft drink. 100% agree to that. But my favorite uh, hill that someone said they would die on uh, in my social media post last week is... You should never use the word irregardless because what you actually mean is regardless, which is true. It's a grammatical hill that you would die on, and I really respect and affirm that that's a hill they would die on. So the story of Esther is about a hill that Esther chooses to die on. Now, it's it's way uh, more important than toilet paper over or under. It's a pretty significant hill. It is a risk that she's taking for a cause that she believes in, and she, she knows that her life is at stake. If I perish, I perish. When she says those words, if I perish, I perish, that's where the whole story flips over. That's in chapter 4. We just heard it read just a little bit ago. If I perish, I perish. Up to that point, Esther has been rather passive in this story, actually. We don't even hear her voice until chapter 4. Other people tell her what to do. Her sort of decisions are made for her. She's a passive observer in the story up until that moment, up until that decision, a decision to take a risk for a cause that she believes in. At the beginning of the story, it's actually Queen Vashti who is the strongest character. Queen Vashti appears in chapter one of this story. Her husband, who is the king of Persia, is a, uh, a a terrible person, <laughs> and, uh, and all he does as king is sort of throw these parties, these, you know, weeks-long banquets where they just get absolutely, completely out of control. And so he's in the middle of one of these parties, hanging out with his buddies, and he says to Queen Vashti, hey, why don't you come in and show all my buddies how pretty you are? And, uh, and Vashti's like, um, 
no, I will not be doing that. Uh, I refuse to objectify myself for the sake of your buddies. And, and his buddies are like, oh, dude, <laughs> you know, if she gets away with that, um, then pretty soon all the wives in the whole kingdom are going to be like, thinking they can speak for themselves. And we can't have that happening, right? We can't have all the wives like having a voice in things. So, you know, you got to do something, king. And so the king's like, okay. And he kicks her off the throne. He deposes her because she wouldn't come parade herself in front of the party. And so, um, because of Vashti's stance and her strength in that moment, the king needs another queen. And so, to keep the misogyny going in the story, the, the king decides to have a, 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 like a, a countrywide, a nationwide beauty contest to find the prettiest woman. And Mordecai is uh, taking care of his niece Esther and says, you know, you should enter that beauty pageant. And so she does. And because she's the most beautiful of all the women, uh, the king chooses her to be the next queen and places her on the throne. I mean, the misogyny is just everywhere in the story. Thank goodness uh, it's such a, you know, we've dealt with misogyny in the world and now it's not an issue anymore. We don't have to think about or worry about. But and nevertheless, uh, that's how Esther becomes the queen. She and her uncle Mordecai are, are Jewish and so she actually hides her Jewishness uh, in the beauty contest to become the queen, which is important because there's an advisor to the king whose name is Haman. And Haman's like, um, he says to the king one day, you know, we should build a statue and have people bow down to this statue. And the king says, all right, let's do that. They build the statue. They tell all the people to, build, to bow down to the statue. Mordecai says, no, I can't do that. I can't bow down to this statue. I'm Jewish. And it's sort of against the laws to, to worship a graven image. It's a big one for us. So I'm not going to bow down to this statue. Well, that makes Haman really, really mad. And Haman says to the king, you know, because that Mordecai guy is causing you trouble, you should issue a decree that all the Jews should be killed. All right? Overreaction. But nevertheless, the king issues this decree. All the Jews should be killed. He sets the date on which this thing is going to happen. So, Esther now has a problem because she's Jewish. So Mordecai goes to Esther and is like, you got to say something. You need to speak up here. She said, I can't. It's against the law. He hasn't summoned me into the throne room and I, if I'll be put to death if, if I go without him calling me there. And Mordecai's like, you know, maybe you became queen. Who knows, right? Maybe you became queen for just such a time as this. That's when she makes the decision. That was the passage we read today. That's when she makes that decision to decide to go before the king and if I perish, I perish. This is the hill that she will die on. She, she creates this elaborate scheme as the story goes along. It's a party. It's a fake party. Not really a party. It's a false party that she invites the king to. That's how she works her way around the not getting summoned into the throne room thing. So she throws this party, invites the king to this party in order to reveal her identity to him. She says, I'm Jewish. You know, your decree that you made, it, you know, it impacts me too. So the king is in a spot because he can't just rescind his decree. So what happens in the story is that he actually issues a second decree saying that on that day, on the day that all the Jews were to be killed, the Jews are now authorized by the king to defend themselves. So that's right. The king has authorized people to kill the Jews and authorized the Jews to defend themselves. It's a mess. It is a made-for-TV miniseries, if I ever saw one. So the Jews uh, do defend themselves. Haman sends the people after the Jews on the day. The Jews defend themselves, and they destroy all of Haman's folks. And that's the end of the story. And that is the celebration of Purim, actually. The whole story is about the celebration of the day of Purim, the day the Jews were empowered to defend themselves. And it all came from Esther's decision. It all came from Esther using her voice at just the right moment to speak up on behalf of God. If I perish, I perish. Have you ever said that? Have you ever uttered those words? If I die, I die. But it's important enough to me that I'm gonna do it. Is there a cause 
Is there an idea? Is there a movement that is so important to you that you would actually die for it? Not just as a metaphor, not just to say that, you know, yes, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. <laughs> but is there a, a cause that, is, that you would actually give your life for? That you would invest all of your resources, you would risk everything you have to accomplish that goal? Have you ever made a decision to do something that was dangerous enough to kill you? Some of us probably have a list of those kinds of decisions. Some of us, it would take a while to think of one. When Esther made that choice and uttered those words, everything changed. That's when this story truly became hers. Now, sermons about the book of Esther always include mention of a kind of a interesting detail. And that is, the book of Esther contains no mention of God. In the entire book, God is not mentioned. There are no names of God mentioned and usually the preacher will say yeah Esther's that book that doesn't mention God and then move on to make the point of the sermon but this time around I kind of got stuck there Esther is a story a book of the Bible the only book of the Bible that doesn't mention the Lord why not what does it mean that this book does not mention God does God's absence in this story have anything to teach us, maybe even teach us about God. Well, there are a few noteworthy things, noteworthy details in the story. I think that would be helpful. The first is the setting of the story itself, the place where it happens. You see, Esther's story happens in a post-exile setting. Um, so the people, uh, when living in Ju Judah, had been conquered by Babylon a generation or so earlier. And when they were conquered by Babylon, they were taken away from Jerusalem into exile. Well, then Babylon was conquered by Persia. And when Babylon was conquered by Persia, Persia said to the Jewish community, you know, we don't really care. You guys can go back home if you want. And so they did, but not all of them. In fact, Esther is a part of a community that did not go back home after exile. That's why this story takes place in Susa, the capital of Persia. There's a prominent, uh, a pretty big Jewish community in Persia. And yet, God acts to save this chosen people, even though they're not in the promised land. For generation after generation, God's covenant had been tied to the land, the promised land, where God's presence was known at the temple in Jerusalem. Here is a story in which the people are saved that's not connected to, the, to, to being actually in the promised land. That no matter where the people of God find themselves, that God is able to act. That God finds a way to save no matter where we are. God's faithfulness is not tied to a specific location. So the second noteworthy detail about Esther is something that Mordecai tells Esther in the passage Aidan read just a second ago. Mordecai makes a point to say to Esther, you know, God will find a way to save the people. Whether you speak up or not, God will find a way Mordecai affirms that it is God who is doing the saving here. That no matter when it is, God will find a way. You have a choice, Esther, he says. We know that God's faithfulness is, is not tied to a given time, but this is the time that we have. So you have a choice, knowing that God will find a way. Why not now? Why not speak up? Who knows, but maybe you are here right now for just such a time as this. God's going to act sometime. Why not this time? Why not now? Knowing that God is going to act, you have a choice. You can stand by and watch God act. You can be a passive observer in your own story. Or you can choose to cooperate with what God is doing. God's going to work no matter when. No matter when it is, God will find a way. But maybe now is that time. Maybe the choice you make right here and now will make a difference 
for what God is trying to accomplish. And Esther does choose to use her voice in that moment in spite of the very real risk to her life. If I perish, I perish. No matter when it is, God will find a way to work. Who knows? Maybe it's right now. So the third detail of the story that's noteworthy is how Esther goes about her business. See, Esther is not just an above-the-board, follow-the-rules kind of person. Esther, in fact, is a bit of a trickster. She doesn't necessarily follow the rules. In fact, right off the bat, she's not following the rules because she has married a Gentile. I mean, that's a biggie for the Jewish people. To marry a Gentile is pretty much breaking the rules. She also doesn't eat pure food. She eats this impure food that's a part of the, the festival feasts. She breaks that rule as well. She's deceptive in her, in her approach. She, she hides her identity. She does not reveal that she is Jewish and lives that way for some time. She throws this, this party that's not really a party in order to work her way around the rules that the king has put down. She's a trickster. She, she's not really um, you know, following all the rules by the, by the standard expectations of behavior. And, and so it seems to me that Esther has learned something from what Vashti tried earlier on, right? Because what Vashti tried was just a direct defiance, right? Direct defiance. I'm not going to do that. But that didn't work with the king. She was deposed. And so Esther said, well, I need to learn from that. Direct defiance isn't going to work to accomplish this purpose. So this deceptive path is the way. This not quite honest path is the way. Maybe God's saving work is not tied to just the correct behavior that follows the rules every single time. It leads us to another question about who defines what the correct behavior is and who writes the rules in the first place. Maybe it's more like no matter what we do, God will find a way. Now, before I go further, I want to clarify, I am not going so far as to say that anything goes. Just do whatever you want and God will find a way. Don't misunderstand me. I'm mindful of scripture passages like Joshua 1 that says, be strong and courageous, be careful to act in accordance with all the law that my mo servant Moses commanded. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left so that you may be successful wherever you go. I'm mindful of passages like Romans 6. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin go on living in it? So the point here is not do whatever you want and God will find a way. Just let God sort out the details, right? That's not what I'm saying. I think maybe what I'm saying, maybe the point here is that we put way too much pressure on ourselves to do just the right thing at just the right time in just the right place. Maybe we put too much pressure on God Likewise, with our unreasonable expectations that, that God can only act in a certain place at a certain time and in a certain way. Maybe the point here is we can't limit how God might work in this world by our notions of place and time and method. Esther was God's instrument, even though God isn't mentioned in the Bible, and maybe especially because God isn't mentioned in the book of Esther. She's God's instrument through which God acts to save the people. No, she's not in the promised land. She's in Persia, no matter where you are. No, she, she spoke up to the king, but if she hadn't, someone else would have, no matter when it is. She broke the rules. She disguised her identity. She she was a trickster. No matter what we do, God finds a way. Somehow or other, God finds a way to deliver people. God finds a way to save. Somehow or other, God's grace finds a way to save the people over and over and over again. The past five months, church, we have learned a lot about how God can show up in the most unexpected places in, at the most unexpected times and in the most unexpected ways. Here's a picture of last week's Bible giveaway. There's also a video online of that event that's just wonderful. You know, we want to present Bibles to our kindergartners and our third graders. How is that going to happen? How 
we, might we do that? And then there's this absolutely ridiculous idea. I know, why don't we have them drive up to the door in their cars uh, and hand it to them and we'll put a line of cars out in the parking lot and invite people to come honk their horns at them while that happens. Ridiculous. But you know what? God showed up, y'all. God showed up in an amazing and powerful way and there was energy and the Holy Spirit was all over it. It should not have worked as well as it did. But it did. Check that video out and you can see it for yourself. Over and over again in this past season, God has shown up in, in crazy ways. Last week, I was a part of a small group of people who was piloting an idea that's Jim Pike's favorite word, piloting. We're piloting an idea for worship together. A small group meeting outside, distancing from one another. And we had prayer, and we had some liturgy, and we had Holy Communion together. And I mean, I didn't know going into it, if God was going to show up, just we were going to give it a shot, you know? And oh man, it was, it was powerful. It was amazing. God showed up in a wonderful, wonderful way. And so having piloted that idea in the month of September, we are going to make it available for the congregation. There will be sign-up required ahead of time so that we could limit those group sizes, but they'll be spread out multiple times over the weeks of September. So look for some more information coming soon about ways that, that we can have communion together and have moments of worship in kind of a face-to-face -face way and see, just see if maybe God will show up, even if we're doing something very different. Even as simple as keeping people connected to the body of Christ. You know, at the beginning of this thing, we, we asked, you know, what about those folks who, who are, you know, isolated on, on their own and may not have as much technology as some other people have? How can we keep them connected? Because it's really important for, for the entire body of Christ to be as connected as possible. How can, would God even be able to find a way to do that? And, and again, just this ri ridiculous idea, we could call them. <laughs> you mean people use telephones to actually call people these days? I mean, I didn't know that still was a thing, but turns out it is. However, when we started looking at the list, we realized, you know, that's going to be hundreds of telephone calls. That's going to be hundreds of phone calls. How are we ever going to manage that? Our Stephen ministers said, we can do that. Give us the list. Names and numbers. We'll divide it up. We'll call them. And it was so simple. And it was so ridiculous. And yet God showed up in an amazing, profound, meaningful way, no matter where, no matter when, no matter what, God is at work in this season. We place unreasonable expectations on ourselves and on God that it has to be just right, just the right place, just the right time, just the right way. We need to knock that off, make room for the Holy Spirit to work. Because now, y'all, now the key for us, and not just us as Manchester UMC, but the key for the church of Jesus Christ in the world is going to be to remember, to remember the lessons that we are learning as we emerge from this season of weirdness. We have learned so much about how God can show up without all the hoopla in the simplest of ways, in spite of our preconceived notions and expectations. And it would be a tragic loss if we forgot and rushed right back into just doing church as usual. The story of Esther helps us to see we cannot limit God to only certain places, only certain times, only certain behaviors. Nor should we hold ourselves to those unreasonable expectations. It means that, among other things, once and for all, the Church of Jesus Christ will formally ban the phrase, but we've always done it that way. Can I get an amen? amen. Comment an amen on the Facebook feed. We have proven that no matter where we are, no matter when it is, and no matter what we are doing, God will find a way, and that is a hill that I will die on. Would you pray with me, please? Living God, forgive us for limiting you. 
Forgive us for our preconceived notions and our expectations about getting it exactly right at exactly the right time and exactly the right place. Free us from those expectations, O God, so that like Esther, we can use our voice to accomplish your purpose. God, no matter what, you will find a way. And we long with all of our hearts to move from passive observers to active participants in what you are doing in the world. Show us how to do that and how to continue becoming the church you want us to be. We love you. We pray to you in the name of Jesus and in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Amen.